Hello and welcome to Season 8 of How to Start Up, a podcast for anyone starting a company. Hosted by me, Juliet Fallowfield, founder of PR, communications and podcast consultancy, Fallowfield & Mason. It's more important than ever for businesses to incorporate sustainable and ethical practices into their products and services. Not only is this morally the right thing to do, but it also makes commercial sense as customers become more discerning with who they spend their money with. As we enter this eighth season, I wanted to hear from successful founders on how they have built sustainability and ethicality into their businesses and how new founders can follow in their footsteps to build the next generation of responsible companies. I hope the advice and guidance that they share in these episodes will guide you in making your business as sustainable and ethical as possible. If you have any questions on the topics in this season or from previous guests or on PR communications on podcasting, I'd love to hear from you on juliet at fallowfieldmason.com. I hope you enjoy the season. I'm delighted to be kicking off this season with founders of sustainability consultancy SIG Connects, Jen, Mika and Ashlyn. With extensive backgrounds across beauty, technology and sustainability, the team came together in 2019 to help other founders and businesses become more sustainable and benefit a wider group of societal stakeholders other than just shareholders. As experts in becoming B Corp certified, the three founders share practical advice on how to achieve B Corp certification and how every business has the potential to be a force for good. It is great to welcome the team, the founding team of Sig Connects to How to Start Up Today to talk all things B Corp. And first off, I'd love you guys to introduce yourselves. So Ashling, if you'd like to kick off. Hi, so I'm Ashling. I am a sustainability solutionist and a co-founder of Sig Connects. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm CEO and co-founder of Sig Connects. And I'm Mika, and I'm also a co-founder of Sid Connects, and I have very recently changed my title to Chief Systems Change Officer. So for the background around why we're doing this today, we wanted to do a season focus around how businesses can start as they mean to go on, and with that, put people and planet above their profit. You guys are all things expert in sustainability and most recently started Sid Connects, which helps companies become B Corp certified. We have gone through the cohort with you and absolutely loved the process. And we wanted to chat to you for our listeners to really learn about what they could do to start the right way. So maybe it's a good place to start to ask you, what does Sid Connects offer clients? Well, we specialize in B Corp. But we work to any sustainability framework and we are trying to help businesses become a force for good. And we do that by embedding a framework so that their sustainability initiatives are part of their growth strategy. So when I got my first job in 2005 at L'Oreal and I was PR intern and I remember Mika saying to me, are you sure you want to work at L'Oreal? You know, like, have you kind of done any research on like supply chain in the beauty industry or what's happening? And, you know, like often beauty brands say this product hasn't been tested on animals when all the ingredients in the supply chain have been tested on animals and then they mix it all together and say not tested on animals. So she was kind of always getting me to do this research. And I was like, you're ruining this for me. This is my first job. Stop ruining it for me. But I would always be the one asking the tricky questions. So I was always the one in work, you know, saying, um, what's actually the happening behind the scenes when the gender pay gap was announced? And and that's where Jen and I always hit it off as well, because we were always the annoying people asking the tricky questions in the marketing team. But in communications, you absolutely have to, because if you're going externally to press to claim something, you as a human being want to know what you're saying is correct and factually correct and ethically correct. So I think a lot of PRs will feel your pain in that because often you have to ask the difficult questions internally. So when they're asked externally, you're covered. And a lot of the clients we work with carry the umbrella so it won't rain. And that's what happened with Ashling and I quite often is that we would be asking those difficult questions Mm. and they didn't want to answer them. So usually the response we got is they just stopped inviting us to meetings, you know? So they were like, we don't want these, you know, these difficult questions. We don't want to answer them. So let's just not invite them to this meeting. And then they wonder why there's no coverage. And then social media has a lot to answer for. But one of the great things about social media was that brands had nowhere to hide anymore. 
Yeah. So suddenly consumers could ask questions directly and the brands would have to answer it. And suddenly those questions that we would be asking would be coming back to our desk saying, oh, actually, you, your communications director, can you give us a response on this? Yeah. And I would be like, well, we've been trying to prepare for it, but you don't want to talk about the supply chain. You don't want to talk about diversity, equity and inclusion. You don't want to talk about any of the societal issues. Well, firstly, I'd want to ask you how you define sustainability because I have a theory that if you do anything consistently you're sustainable so you could be a sustainable axe murderer if you murder someone with an axe every day you're sustaining that behavior it doesn't necessarily mean you're good Ashlyn define sustainability it's such a great question you get to your point what is the definition of sustainability there's a load of different definitions right if you if you google it there's going to be a million different definitions the UN so we go on the UN and the academic definition which is meeting the needs of the present without compromising compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So that's the official definition, right? So us being able to live, meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Us being able to live, our children being able to live, our grandchildren being able to live. It's not rocket science. And then there's three pillars to sustainability. So when I went back and studied, everyone thought I was kind of just kind of working on environmental issues. And that is the first pillar of sustainability, the environment. The second pillar is the societal pillar, gender equality, Black Lives Matter, the mental health pandemic we find ourselves in, like all of these big societal issues that really the pandemic really brought to the forefront. And then the one that was really kind of shocking to me was the third pillar, which I didn't have a clue on, which is this economic pillar. And so society and the economy are completely interdependent, right? And again, we saw this with the pandemic. It was a nightmare when the shops weren't open. No one wants to be furloughed. We learned this new word furlough, like society and the economy are completely interdependent. And then if you don't have the planet, you don't have all three. So sustainability is really about bringing those kind of three pillars into balance. So instead of just having an economy that's exploiting people and planet, it's actually serving people and planet. And I always tell people when they hear the definition of sustainability, the academic definition doesn't actually talk about climate change. And I'm always saying it's not about climate change, it's about systems change. Our climate crisis is a symptom of a much larger problem. And we can't keep putting a sticking plaster over all of the little symptoms. We have to go back to the source. So this is all about changing how we live, because that definition of sustainability, I break it down like this. The planet will eventually recover itself but we might not be here to see it. It's really about our survival as a species on this planet. So we have to take into account everything. It's not, you can't just recycle your plastics and say, there you go, I'm doing my bit for the planet. This is about the system we live in. And that's, that's where the work is. And like Ashling said, there are these three pillars that hold up this concept of sustainability. And that is all about the system we live in, because really what we should have done 50 years ago is down tools and go to live in a mud hut. But nobody did that. We all carried on living the way we want to live. And we're not going to change that much. We, we are just going to have to change the system so that we can survive the way human beings need to survive and still leave a planet intact better than we found it for the next generation that comes along. And that's why Mika's changed her title to Chief Systems Change Officer. <laughs> this is where it was interesting to chat to you guys, supporting new founders who are starting businesses. They have an opportunity to start as they mean to go on and build a business that will look at all of those different pillars. And as we all know, undoing something and then learning how to do it better the next time takes more time than if you start doing it right from the get-go. However, when you start a company, you have a billion things to think about at any given point. How can you maybe lessen that anxiety around, it's another thing I have to do as a founder? I would say first, I think that if you're going to start a business today, it's an essential part of your business. Sustainability isn't this kind of nice to have. It's essential. And it's essential not just for things like investment, which they will definitely be asking about in their due diligence. But it's essential for consumers. You're going to be asked those questions. Consumers are expecting sustainability to be part of your brand. And if you're starting a brand today, it really needs to be one key pillar within that. Obviously, there's a lot to do. And I think that's why those kind of three pillars of sustainability are so important, because 
what Ashton touched upon is that there's people, planet, and profit. So your business needs to make money. Like that, that aspect needs to happen. But it's just about how we go about it and how we balance making money and our planet and our people. Because at the moment, the way we're doing business is that we're just putting shareholders at the heart of everything we do, delivering as much money as possible for our business. And what that usually means is that we've exploited people and planet along the way. So we need to bring those three pillars back into balance. And it's always the balance. I always say to people, you know, with sustainability, you're always on a journey. It never stops. You're constantly balancing those three pillars. And I think that it's essential for new businesses to ensure that they are working to balance those three pillars of people, planet and profit. Well, I think I found it so rewarding just starting a business. I had an opportunity to take everything I'd learned from previous big brands I'd worked for and cherry pick all the best bits. If you think about right now, we have like unsustainable levels of inequality. Yeah. We have the collapse of our natural ecosystem. Like the way we're doing business, it's not working. So we can't continue to keep doing business in that way. And that's why it's so important to have that systems change aspect is because what we're doing now, yes, it's delivering money. But if we don't have a planet in the future, we're not going to have anywhere to spend that money. So, you know, we really need to change the way we think about things. It's not just the right thing to do, but it's also mandatory. So talk about B2B, B2C, B2E, business to employer, B2I, business to investor, B2B, another B2 board. There's so many of your stakeholders that are going to actually demand that this is going to happen. Absolutely. And my professor would say that, you know, as a species, like the human species, we haven't figured out how to make money. So grow the economy without exploiting people and planet. And the world will change and come back into balance when we figure out how to make money. It's the lifeblood. We all want to make money, but maybe by serving people and planet and solving some of these big societal issues while making money at the same time. And that's why sustainability entrepreneurs, so startups who are doing this, are absolutely key. Juliet, what you described in how you wanted to set up your business, you're talking about effectively something similar to the triple bottom line where you are measuring the success of your business in terms of what value you're getting from it. So you have decided that actually, yes, what you want back from this business is not just money. You want that good feeling. You want all of the good feelings that you got in the past. You're going to condense them and make sure they exist in your business. And that's really important. And people who are entering the world of work now, I think they have a very kind of strong sense of the things that money can't buy. And so they're fully expecting Mm. that as they put themselves, their brain power, their effort and their energy into the world of work, what they want back is not just money, but happiness, clean air, fresh Mm. water. You know, all of these things have a really intrinsic value and we're starting to understand that and we're starting to work in exchange for things other than money. I think ask any person that's become self-employed, it isn't just about the revenue. And previous and other careers, it would be my base plus my bonus potential and what could I earn next year, da 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 and what mortgage could that potentially afford me? Now it's how happy is my brain? How happy are my team? What people do I get to speak to? There's so many other things on that bar chart that have value that I never even knew existed. And I think until you throw yourself in at the deep end and learn the hard way, and that's where it becomes really rewarding. But on that, what was really rewarding was going through the B Corp with you guys. There are a number of other certifications out there. Mika, I was hoping you could talk through the variety and why B Corp is the one that you decided to specialize in. Well, for me, I've always been a bit suspicious of of all these ESG frameworks. And the reason I like B Corp is because it asks businesses to make a legal commitment. And not everyone knows that. You have to actually change your legal documentation. So in this country, in the UK, that looks like your articles of association. And you, at the moment, those hold your business to a shareholder model. And B Corp asks you to insert wording that shifts your legal commitment into a stakeholder model. And I think that's also what gives it an element of trust. And beyond that, I think the fact that it's such a living, breathing assessment and it is 
very much based in like what you are doing, what are the actions you are taking rather than the goals that you are putting forward. And that means it's hard to just do it and put it in a drawer. And every time we've taken a business through it, they've been excited. Like they get to a point where they go, okay, I get this now and this is inspiring and this is giving me ideas. All new founders want to start, they mean to go on. Are there some basic business practices that you advise them to start right from the beginning? I think for businesses, um, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it, right? And as businesses, we have to be profitable. We have to measure our money. You have to see your money improving and going up. And it's the same now with your environmental and your societal impact. You need to put a stake in the ground. You know what you need to know where you stand and you need to be able to measure it and improve and have a point of view for your, your customers, um, anyone who wants to invest or basically all of your your stakeholders. So in terms of tracking and measuring and things like that, are there any platforms that new founders can sign up to to start measuring things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the B Corp, the B Impact Assessment is a free tool. So basically anyone can download it. It's called the B Impact Assessment. It's totally free. And the idea is that it doesn't matter whether you're a sole trader in the UK or if you're Patagonia, everyone can start measuring and tracking. And even if you don't have a business, do you know what I mean? Even if you're a student, you can just download this free tool and realize what your rights are. So we would highly recommend everyone just downloads um, the B Impact Assessment. You know, you can kind of just have it as a dummy account and just put a stake in the ground. You know, don't be afraid. I think often we're so worried that we're doing something wrong and, and that kind of we're going to make a mistake. But, you know, you can't let perfection be the enemy of good. You just have to start measuring and tracking and just and, and improving. Ashling often talks about that B Corp framework as almost like a, a digital mentor. So there's the question about like, how do you track? And then there's the question of what do you track? And that is the bit that a lot of business owners can't quite get their head around right at the forefront. So if you hop onto that B Corp assessment and just start playing around and seeing what you're being asked, because measuring your impact is quite complex and it's very purpose-led. So if your business has a purpose, how do you track that? How do you measure the outcomes from that? A lot of people don't kind of follow through. And actually, it's very, very rewarding to do that. And and it can be incredibly useful as your business grows. And if you just want to get into the nuts and bolts of like, okay, how do I start uh, tracking the energy I use? Or how do I measure the carbon footprint of my business? There are tons of online tools and it can honestly be as easy as just fishing out your electricity bill. You know, if you're a service-based company and you're hybrid, you've got people working from home. We're all using electricity. Where's it coming from? It'll say on your bill and you'll be able to answer a bunch of those questions. So I think that's what's really important. That framework gives you a starter to think about of like, who am I banking with? Am I looking at my supply chain? Am I aware of who I'm employing? It just gives you that awareness of what you're going to be asked a year, two years into your business when you might want to become certified. I would also like to add that sometimes startups feel that like they're too small to make a difference. Do you know what I mean? It's this view of like, I'm too tiny. There's no point in me starting this. I can't really make an impact. You know, why should I measure my carbon emissions? But like, the power of collaboration. So again, the whole point of B Corp, it doesn't matter the size of your business. If every single SME gets on a framework where it's it's tracking, measuring, improving, again, that's when everything changes. And you know, the majority of businesses in the UK are SMEs. Let's all come together and drive that change. So is there anything new founders should not do when they start? So from my side, I think often when you're a new founder, you really have to be conscious on your time, right? And B Corp have this line, no margin, no mission. 
So money really is the lifeblood of your organization. And that's why once you become B Corp certified, you become part of something called the Beehive, where all the businesses shop and buy from each other because they're really about growing your business. So I don't ever feel sustainability should come at the cost of, of your business going out of business. Your business needs to be profitable. And I think often sometimes I see startups kind of putting too much into sustainability and not growing their business. So it really, really is about the balance. No margin, no mission. You know, you can't be making an impact if you're out of business. And also, I think a lot of people still think that having this sustainability piece in their business is a luxury and maybe they can't afford it. And we are coming to crunch time and you're going to have to get out in front of this before you get left behind. And we have seen with our own eyes when, you know, when people kind of are really scattergun or they're trying to retrofit, it just sucks up 50% more of your time and resources. The policy change is coming. And this is where startups totally have the advantage because you can start it from day one. It also makes you more efficient as well. Like that's the other thing is that you could sit here and, and not have a framework, not have any plan. And you just kind of, oh, let's be sustainable about this. And let's maybe look at our packaging today, but we don't have a system in place. You're kind of just doing things here and there, you know, not really making a plan, not making it intrinsic to, you know, how your business grows. And you're kind of not really like organizing yourself to understand where you're making the biggest impact and where's your business going to make the biggest difference. And I think that's what's so amazing about the B Corp framework is that actually it allows your business to focus and really put your time into and energy into the things that are going to make a difference instead of wasting a lot of time on kind of small things that are time intensive, but actually not making a huge difference. So it allows you to focus your business on like, we're going to make a big impact in these three areas. So let's focus our time and energy there. Well, actually, Jen, on that, given that B Corp could be a little bit overwhelming at the beginning. Can you give listeners a quick overview as to the B Corp process in terms of the timeline? With B Corp, I mean, the process does really depend on the size of your business. So when you start the B Impact Assessment, which is the assessment that you take um, to get B Corp certified, so you complete the assessment. And if you're over 80 points, you then submit your application. When you submit your application, you're then put in a queue and you wait to go through a verification phase. So your B impact assessment, it morphs and changes depending on the size of your business, what industry you're in, and what kind of sector you're in. So if you're a services only business, your environment section of the B impact assessment is going to look very different than if you're a construction business, which is a very kind of energy and water intensive business. And you're going to have very different questions. I would say if you're a startup, for example, you're under 10 people and you're a services only business. If you have all your policies and things in place, it's usually a process that I would say you can complete in a few months time, but it really depends on your business. So it took Sid Connect, for example, it took us about three months to submit our application. And when we run courses, like, so for example, when we run it with yourself, it's usually a kind of three month process because you kind of have to do a lot of back and forth of gathering things. So you go through the assessment. If you score over 80 points, you then submit. B Corp in the UK is extremely popular at the moment. There's a lot of businesses submitting for B Corp. So the wait time is about five months until an analyst contacts you to take you through what's called the verification stage. And the verification stage is where they go through and they actually check what you answered. Is that actually correct? So you have a third party independent analyst coming to you and making sure that what you said you did actually happened. So they, they're going to check your evidence, ensure that it's, it's all stacking up based on the answers that you put on your assessment. That's kind of what gives B Corp its credibility is the fact that it's third party certified. So B Lab in the UK, for example, so B Lab then come in, they send an analyst, they're not for profit and they assess your assessment and ensure that you've done everything you said. On that, I, from a PR perspective, am very aware that B Corp is potentially getting to the tall poppy stage in the sense that people like to pull it down. And greenwashing is a term often used in marketing or shouldn't be used in marketing. So how do people know that they're not being greenwashed? How do they know that it's authentic? How do they know that their mission has actual value and they're not just following a trend? Well, 
I often joke I'm a reformed greenwasher, you know, and that greenwashing went into a dictionary just last year. So it's not actually a legal term, but it went into the dictionary last year as vague or misleading information about environmental or societal practices. It's been around for a long, long time. And so businesses have just been trying to get consumers to buy stuff and they'll say anything. COP26 is the UN big climate change conference of the parties and it took place in Glasgow um, a couple of years ago. And in the run up to that, the government set up a new watchdog specifically calling out brands for greenwashing. And they were really focusing on food, fashion, beauty as the kind of culprits. And they really, they have kind of stuck to it. So they, they've been very particular um, they have something called the Green Claims Code, which I'd highly recommend everyone downloading and having a look at. You know, there's another term called green hushing. A lot of the time, businesses that are really taking a leadership position and doing some great stuff behind the scenes are a bit afraid to communicate it because they're afraid of being called out. So that's green hushing as well. So it's really about striking that balance of of being a leader in your space and not being afraid. But also just to add to that, I mean, one thing I always say to businesses, you know, we want to make sure we're authentic. Well, if you're putting something out and you can tell it doesn't feel right, it's probably not. It means you either need to be more specific or you need to ensure that you are speaking to something that is intrinsic to your business instead of just trying to jump on a trend or a bandwagon. So I think it's really important. And back it up. Exactly. And I mean, it is a balance because I think green hushing, is like we've almost scared people into saying nothing, right? I mean, this is the great thing about going through processes or frameworks like B Corp is that it actually gives you the confidence to talk about the initiatives that, that you have in place because you can see how they all stack up compared to everything else you're doing. And I think that's what's really important is just gaining that confidence to be able to speak about what you're doing. I agree with that 100%. You know, when we take clients through B Corp, there's often this very specific moment where they shift from being a bit defensive, like, oh, I'm being asked all these questions and am I going to be good enough and am I coming up short to actually getting those metrics down, starting to track and measure and then saying, oh my God, yeah, I I do pretty well. <laughs> and shifting into a place of pride exactly that and then and then really wanting to talk about that and I think like Jen said authenticity comes from actual hard facts and that all that tracking and measuring and the data if you've got that behind you you will feel confident and you will feel proud and you will have something interesting to say and it will capture other people's imagination. Is it true that companies can say anything they like in their website and their press releases and it's only when it's advertised that they could be sued for misleading again it depends on if you're b corp certified so it's third party checks so when you go through the b corp process they like check your mission and make sure that you're saying what you say you're doing and i think in terms of advertising versus your website i worked in marketing for a long time and there's just different risk levels. So it's not that you can just say anything anywhere. They are they are being regulated, but there's only so many people to regulate it and to call. Usually advertising is called out because somebody's complained about it. So, you know, when someone goes on and says, we have oats that are good for the planet, that's a vague and misleading comment around your environmental or societal impact, right? So usually somebody has complained to the ASA and that's why it's been pulled up and called out in the press. With websites, there's a lot of websites out there. There's a lot of content on websites. They're not as public, so it just doesn't get called out as much. So it's not that they're not regulated. And it's just that if you're a business and you, I guess, if you do want to say a vague comment, you can put it on your website and it's less likely to get caught. So you really encourage businesses to do the best they possibly can, but also talk about it because it will inform other people how they could change their own behavior as well. So don't shy away from it. We always say talk about it actually as like that has to happen for for change to happen in the world. You know, mm. Ashling has done a sustainability master's. I went and did a circular economy course. And what the professors always said to us is there is a huge gap in how people talk about sustainability. And there is a huge gap in education around it. So it's almost a point of responsibility. If you are doing this work as a business and you are understanding it and you have something to say, do say it because mm. we're all interested and we all have to learn 
like and we have to learn from each other you know not everyone can do everything but if you have a, a specialty and there is something that you're doing and you have insight you must share it I think you have a responsibility to share it as well as it just being good marketing sitting on the line of I'm in communications and I always encourage people to communicate the right things at the right time with the right messaging. It's music to my ears that you're giving it the blessing of like, yes, go forth and communicate all the good that you're doing because it's exciting. And I think those conversations lead to more conversations that lead to the greater good. So something that we do with guests is we have a question from the previous guest for the next guest. And their question for you was what has been your biggest leadership challenge in setting up your business? Being a woman, I'd say, and I know that can sound a bit cliche, but actually like we women face so many systemic barriers to setting up a business. It takes a lot of overcoming imposter syndrome, knowing that you are good enough to do this because you are told throughout your career that you're not. I think that that is probably one of the biggest challenges that I've had to face throughout my career is realizing that actually what I'm doing is good. It's different, but it's good. And actually... I can just go out and start my own business. Ashlyn? So I'm a huge fan of leadership. I got a scholarship to the Rising Women Leaders Programme at Cambridge University, which actually changed my life. I, I, that's how I ended up going back and doing a master's. And I left my corporate job and went back into the master's in sustainability. I think leadership is everything. There's a book called The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, which I think everyone should read. One of those commitments is around feeling your feelings. And I think working with like these two other women is been the first time ever in my life I've been allowed to come to work and actually say how I'm feeling and not have to mask it, right? And, and be vulnerable and be like, this is what's going on for me today. And I'm feeling stressed or challenged. And I work with two women who actually want the best for me. Um, so kind of, I think, deconditioning myself from many, many years in corporate and having to mask and then also, I think sustainability requires leadership. You know, we can be a sustainability leader at any point in our life, in our career. And we really have to inspire everyone when it comes to sustainability, because as we just touched on, the biggest issue for the sustainable development goals is low citizen awareness. And Mika? I think my greatest leadership challenge has been, it's been twofold. Firstly, moving from being a freelancer always behind the scenes. You know, usually I would be the one who, you know, would put together some copy for a podcast like this. I wouldn't be the one talking on the podcast. <laughs> uh, so I've found that challenging to push myself forward. And also that kind of imposter syndrome for me is also linked to my age. So I'm coming up to 50 and to be starting a career at this time of my life. Yeah, I've had to dig deep. So, you know, to sort of say, Yes, I do have wisdom and I do have something to offer. And I'm not the crazy old lady ranting about the planet. <laughs> not at all. That's been my main set of challenges. And like Ashling, you know, I really rely on Ashling and Jen because like they won't let me hide. They keep they keep going, nope, off you go, come on, up on the podium, go and do this, go and talk, you can do it. And then it turns out I can do it. So that's great. <laughs> well, congratulations. And what would be your question for the next guest? Well, we were thinking about this and we're obviously very interested in what businesses are doing around their sustainability efforts. And we are super curious for your next guest to tell us what legacy do they want to leave behind with their business? When they're dead and gone and their business hopefully continues and thrives, what change has happened in the world because they started their business? Brilliant. Thank you. And any last golden nugget pieces of advice you'd like to offer a new founder when considering B Corp? I mean, I would like to add, you know, Anita Roddick, she founded The Body Shop. Never think you're too small. She absolutely, she changed the world, really. You know, when she, when I went back and studied sustainability, there's been so many academics papers on how she moved the businesses from a shareholder model to a stakeholder model. So don't think you're too small. She was a British woman who was coming up against so many challenges. I'd say be curious. You can have a little look, that first step to see what's behind the B of B Corp. That is free. 
and it is open source. It is available to anyone and everyone is encouraged to just just be curious and see what's there for you and keep an open mind and do not feel mm. judged. There is no room for you to carry around feelings of judgment. Let that go. And Jen? I mean, I would just say, because I think we live in this world where we're always too busy for everything. I would say, stop saying you're too busy because you're never too busy to do something good for the world. Mm. And also enjoy the process. It's the work of a lifetime. (laughs) It's not going anywhere. So you've got to enjoy the sustainability process. It is the work of our lifetime now, you know, for everyone. Well, also from a ridiculous geeky perspective, the joy of B Corp, if anyone likes ticking a box and getting something off their to-do list, the B Corp process is the most rewarding thing ever. I would go into like a four hour time block of, I'm just going to do one thing, focus on it and do it really well. And then I'm going to go back to Bedlam after that. But it was almost such a treat. Thank you so much, all three of you for joining us Startup Today. We have learned so much about B Corp. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having us. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. If you'd like to get in touch with SigConnects, you can find all of their details in the show notes, along with a recap of the advice that they have so kindly shared. Thank you for listening to How to Start Up. I hope these conversations offer you some confidence, encouragement and reassurance that you're on the right track. If you enjoy this podcast, I'd be so appreciative if you were to rate, review and subscribe as it will really help other people starting a company discover it. Of course, if you've got any questions at all on PR communications or podcasting, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me because at Fallowfield and Mason, we love supporting startups. Thank you.